This video is sponsored by Audible. For a free audiobook, use the link in the description below. Today is September 30th, 2024, and Reactor Magazine has released three more Wind and Truth preview chapters. So in this video, I will be diving into these three chapters and giving my thoughts. Chapter 16 is titled Vague Promises and Hints. For the epigraph, we get another part of the fourth parable from the in-world book, The Way of Kings. This chapter starts from Shalon's perspective. It picks up just after she and Adolin's shower scene. She's laying on the shower floor, letting the water run over her. We see that her armor sprint are still following her around, even though she's in the physical realm, and they're taking the shapes of objects around her and calling out her name. We see that Shalon is determined to find a way to fix her bond with Testament and heal the Spren. Shalon has a meeting with her group of light weavers, and we learn that the tensions are growing between her group, known as the Unseen Court, and the Ghostbloods. We also see that Wit has provided them with 12 sketches depicting 12 different members of the Ghostbloods on Roshar, and we find out that Eatil has called in some off-worlder reinforcements. We see that the Windrunners have begun developing Morse code to use via span read. So that's pretty cool. Shalon plans to create a strike team to fight the Ghostbloods. And as far as Shalon knows, the Ghostbloods have no idea where Ba Otto Mishram is imprisoned. She plans to use this to her advantage by reaching the prison before they do. But we as the readers know that the Sion Ale has already relayed that information to Eatil and Didakar. So this plan will likely end poorly for Shalon. Shalon still hears and replies to Vale's voice in her mind. This is pretty interesting. She didn't fully lose that part of her, which is a good thing considering how capable Vale is. Her and the other members of the Unseen Court test and see if she can share her new armor with the other Lightweavers, similar to how Kaladin did. And it works, kind of. It locks in place as soon as Shallan stops touching the other person it formed around. So it seems that either her armor sprint need more practice, or that Lightweaver armor simply functions differently than Windrunner armor. But locking another person in place with armor could potentially be pretty useful in a fight. So I'd bet that we'll see it used against an enemy later in this book. Shallan plans to use her Lightweavers to steal information about Marais and the Ghostbloods, but first, she needs to find the Ghostblood's new base. Then we get Dalinar's perspective. It picks up just as he's stepping away to speak with Storming Cultivation herself. He asks her to give him the answers of how to defeat Odium, but she tells him that he has to find those answers on his own to respect their meaning. And then we get another absolute bombshell dropped on us. Cultivation tells Dalinar that the Shard of Honor wasn't actually splintered. It turns out that the power of the Shard of Honor is actually the power and substance of the visions Dalinar was shown, and it's actively searching for a new vessel to hold it. She tells Dalinar that he needs to see better, farther, and deeper into the past, and to go into the spiritual realm, where gods dwell. There he will receive the final truths of the heralds, the radiance, and honor himself. I think this is going to be one crazy ride of a book, basically a sander lanch the whole way through. I'm so hyped for this, I can't wait till December 6th. Dalinar speaks with the Stormfather in his mind, and we find out that the Stormfather wasn't able to sense or hear the conversation that Dalinar and Cultivation had. So Dalinar fills him in, and the Stormfather, as usual, is pretty grumpy about the whole situation. He thinks it's too dangerous for Dalinar to see all the visions of the past. Apparently this whole time, he's been purposely withholding some of the visions. We also get this tidbit that reinforces the idea that Cultivation is indeed playing 4D chess and planning for many many years in advance making tiny nudges to move her pieces that are the mortals of the cosmere in the direction that she wants to make things happen we see wit using what i'm pretty sure is a tamu kek to communicate with someone off world the off worlder that he's communicating with will be revealed in 
in a little bit. Then we get a page from Shallan's sketchbook that shows her new armor, both of her shard blades, and some general thoughts that she has on this new armor. I must say I really like this little satchel that she has built into the armor for her sketchbook. The real world artist of this sketchbook page is Ben McSweeney. Then we get to chapter 17, which is titled A Tough Kind of Love. We get another epigraph that's another part of the fourth parable from The Way of Kings. This chapter starts from Adolin's perspective. He's heading to the meeting of monarchs. He has a conversation with Yanagon about the fused invasion forces while they're going up the lift. We also get a little bit of insight showing how hurt Adolin feels about having to abandon Kolinar. Then we get Shallan's perspective. She's wearing a disguise and her and a few of her light weavers are keeping an eye on Adolin to ensure he stays safe from the ghost bloods. She gave orders to some of her light weavers to attempt to tail one of the ghost bloods back to their hideout. And we get to see a new type of sprin known as disgust sprin. They look like orange corkscrews drilling downward. Her and Gaz have a conversation about his gambling problem and how he quit cold turkey and then they get a message from Shab indicating a ghost blood has been spotted so they head to see what he's found chapter 18 is titled an exception to the rules and we get another epigraph that's a part of the fourth parable from the way of kings this chapter starts from Adolin's perspective he and Yanagon have just made it to the meeting of monarchs Adolin considers greeting Dalinar, but then decides to instead do the proper thing and ignore the problem and let it fester. The monarchs discuss the fused invasions, and at first, a lot of the blame seems to be directed at Dalinar until Yanagon speaks up. He thanks Dalinar for finding a solution for them and making this contest in eight days possible. Wit confirms that there were indeed loopholes in the contract. He also confirms that the offworlder he reached out to was Frost, but Frost refused to help him. Frost's sister, on the other hand, decided to listen and help. She pointed out that in Alethi law, capturing a kingdom's seat of power counts as conquering the entire kingdom. So the fused armies heading to the capitals of a few of the kingdoms means if those capital cities are overthrown, then that entire kingdom belongs to Odium. We can actually see the conversation that Wit had with Frost and other people throughout the Cosmere by reading the epigraphs of earlier books in the series. For instance, this is from chapter 12 of The Way of Kings, and the epigraph reads, Old friend, I hope this missive finds you well. Though, as you are now essentially a mortal, I would guess that wellness on your part is something of a given. These epigraphs make up a few different letters. You can easily read through them by searching them up on the Coppermind. Uh, and they're all listed out in order. Wit was also able to confirm that the Shard of Odium has a new vessel by sensing the rhythms of Roshar. He doesn't know who this new vessel is, but he knows that they are a genius who has devised a ploy to conquer all of Roshar in 10 days time. The Diagram 2.0 sounds pretty scary. Then we get Shallan's perspective. She and Gaz are speaking with Shab. He spotted one of the Ghostbloods depicted in Wit's sketches spying on Dalinar and Cultivation's conversation. This Ghostbloods agent is a former actor and was recruited recently. I'm not sure who this could be. Uh, if you have any ideas, let me know in the comments. Darcia notifies them via Spandread Morse code that she found the Ghostbloods new hideout. It's in Narak. Shallan plans to sneak into this hideout and gather information before sending a strike team in. These were some fun chapters and they gave us a lot of new information. Let me know your thoughts on these three chapters in the comments below. I'll be making these videos every Monday from now until Wind and Truth officially releases on December 6th, so make sure you hit the subscribe button. Also, Wind and Truth is already available for pre-order, and you can get it or any other book of your choice as an audiobook right now for free thanks to the sponsor of this video, Audible. All you have to do is click the link in the description and sign up for a free Premium Plus membership and Audible will give you a credit. You can use this credit to get any audiobook of your choice for free, whether that's pre-ordering Wind and Truth, getting a different Cosmere book, or a book completely unrelated to the Cosmere. Every month that you're still a member, Audible will give you another credit so you can keep getting more audiobooks. These audiobooks are yours to keep, even if you decide to cancel your membership. I love Audible. It's one of my favorite apps that I have on my phone. I use it every day. My favorite part about Audible is that it allows you to multitask, so you can listen to your favorite books while you're driving or cooking or doing laundry. Use the link in the description below and get your free audiobook. That's it for this video, guys. I'll see you in the next one.